This time on Mega Shippers, dock worker George Peck. The idea is to get as much speed as possible. Is in a race to make space Boom. for thousands of tons of fertilizer before the heavens open. I started to completely fell down. And rain threatens to destroy the seven million pound cargo. Just what we need. In Spain, supporting a round the world yacht race is anything but plain sailing for Bill team leader Piotr Ostrowski. We need to go up and uh, unstuck it. And in Essex, a tight squeeze for classic car dealer Richard Bidolf trying to ship two million pounds worth of vintage motors to Birmingham. Hopefully we can get a few sold. Jing, jing. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got 10 metres to go ahead! One change in conditions... I started to completely fell down. ..could spell disaster. Mother Nature stamped her feet. ..with reputations... ..and lives on the line. Oh. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the mega shippers. The Port of Immingham, Lincolnshire, just outside Grimsby. Britain's busiest cargo port, moving over 55 million tonnes of raw materials and freight every year. Next arrival, the Pochard S. 200 metres long and 23 metres wide. On board, 26,000 tonnes of fertiliser. In charge of getting it off the ship is operations manager Craig Stephen. So at the moment, we're just in the planning stages for 26,000 tonnes uh, of granular rear coming in for two customers, um, about £7 million worth of cargo. Really valuable. It's going to take around 20 guys and around four days to discharge the cargo. Known as urea, it's an essential fertiliser for farmers, made from ammonia and carbon dioxide. Today's load's worth £7 million, but it can be easily destroyed by rainwater. Unfortunately, the weather's just something we have to deal with in this, in this part of the world. And Craig relies on an age-old method of measuring the weather. Sometimes the best weather forecast is literally to put your hand out and see if it's raining. Um, we, all of our cargoes predominantly are weather-dependent. To keep the 26,000 tonnes of fertiliser bone dry, operations manager Craig has to ensure there's enough space in the 5,000 square metre hangar. The end of the shed looks absolutely miles away at the moment, but as the vessel continues the discharge, the cargo will get closer and closer and closer to us to the point where the whole shed will be full. But to make it to the inner offload area, the bulk carrier must squeeze through a narrow lock. The vessel's 200 metres long and 23 metres wide. The lock is 26 metres, the vessel that's come in is 23. So we're going to have about this much room either side of a 200 metre vessel. So bringing it in will be quite tricky. With not much space and notoriously challenging waters, Immingham's specialist tug team will try to bring the Pochard S safely into port. The fleet's newest tug, the Superman, will lead the operation. So bringing the vessel in at night obviously reduces visibility. There's no room for error. Every single thing needs to be planned and done to exact, exact timings. As the bulk carrier inches towards port, the tug crew get ready to take over. Engineer Edgar Dalderis, Captain Wayne Roundtree and first mate Kevin Finn set sail in the Superman. With a 4,000 horsepower engine, the tug has enough torque to help move a ship 15 times its size. The Pochard is um, 199, nearly 200 metres long. So it's quite a big ship and he'll definitely uh, need assistance of tugs. All these jobs are stressful. When things do go wrong on a tug, they go wrong rapidly. An hour's sail outside the port, the tug meets with a bulk carrier. The Pochard, uh, Superman. We're just passing the outfalls now. I'll, uh, I'll keep coming towards you. Thank you. First mate Kevin Finn 
must try and catch a rope thrown from the pushyard's deck. A vital connection to control the bolt carrier's speed and direction. As the pushyard is still moving just over nine miles per hour, Wayne needs to slow her right down to below walking pace before she enters the port's lock. That wheel just stuck as a brake until, until the ship's ready for their man manoeuvres into the lock. The basic danger of it is if it snaps. As the bulk carrier steams towards the lock, Wayne does all he can to slow her down before she gets to the narrow gates. The Pochard weighs nearly 57,000 tonnes fully loaded, so even without her engines running, her momentum could carry her for miles without a helping hand from the tugs. There's very, very little room to play with. They have to get it right first time, otherwise it causes damage to the lot and damage to the ship. If she slows herself down, she'll lose the ability to steer. Tug Captain Wayne is in permanent conversation with the pilot on board the bulk carrier. Yeah, do you want me to put any weight on the starboard quarter pilot or just follow your stern round? Just follow the stern round for now, please. Aye, aye. With just 150 centimetres between the lock walls and the pushyard, Wayne can't risk hitting the sides. It could cause millions of pounds worth of damage. What we don't really want to do now is let the ship rub along the, the concrete blocks as it's going in. Yeah, number two pilot, we're still on 25%. Okay, if I start at 10 now, please, thanks. 10%. We're actually, like, steering him now and, and braking him. Is you clear of the lock? Give us 25, please. Yeah, 25 right of stern. That's correct, would you clear, yeah? Yeah, we'll do, pilot. The lock's only 250 metres long, but it takes the tug team more than half an hour to navigate. That's fine, mate. Lovely, thank you. And with a final nudge from the tugs, the bulk carrier is successfully berthed. Bingo, we're in. We'll go down, have a cup of tea, um, then get ourselves in bed. Another satisfied customer. Having worked into the early morning, the tug crews may be ready for bed, but there's still millions of pounds of cargo to unload. One and a half thousand miles south is Alicante, Spain, a fast-growing resort at the heart of Andalusia that welcomes over 800,000 holidaymakers every year. But on the town's busy marina, a holiday's the last thing on the minds of the team from GAC Logistics. They're transforming the dockside into a brand new village, constructed to accommodate the participants in the Volvo Round the World Yacht Race. The first stage of a 10-month global chase across four oceans. Seven yachts and their crews sailing between 12 countries and covering over 50,000 miles. The yacht crews are the center of attention. But as each group of sailors begin the race, the support crew leap into action. The ground team of over 800 have to dismantle the race village. Nearly two and a half thousand spare parts must be loaded onto a container ship destined for Cape Town, South Africa, 7,000 miles further south, where the tents and pavilions will be rebuilt ahead of the team's arrival. Logistics manager Jeremy Troughton and the rest of his team have got just 96 hours to deconstruct all the race facilities. It's not like any on a bus. We've got 100 containers going on this ship. We've got 2,000 tons of cargo, uh, and it's not just turning up and stepping on board. In parallel with the race, the support buildings will circumnavigate the world on container ships. It's the biggest logistical challenge in the world of sport events. As the yachts head out to sea, the crew on land are also sailing close to the wind. It is so unbelievably tight. It will be right the way down to the wire. Team base breakdown manager Benny van der Waal has a tight schedule. It's the first time this new set of buildings has been taken down. From Volvo Pavilion, 
tilt the dome. It have to be uh, this complete structures have to be gone tomorrow at four or five o'clock. Uh, it's the first uh, bump out. We call it a bump out, so I think it's going to be a late one. On Wednesday, everything has to be gone here because otherwise, if we miss the vessel to uh, Cape Town, then we have a big problem. And just like the yacht crews, the dockside team are a truly international mix. Dutchman Marcello Altoff is breaking down the yacht team's base camps. I'm unbolting the frame, and then the moment all the bolts are loose, he's going to put one rope on one side, and I'm going to take the frame on the other side, and then we're going to let it down, and then guys downstairs are going to take the frame over from us. It's a huge job, with each team base being constructed from more than 300 separate parts. But that's the best part of the job. Heavy duty. Like this, I don't need to go to the fitness. My girlfriend is happy with me. Work goes on late into the night. By morning, the schedule's slipping. Boss Jeremy Troughton has to muck in. Today's one of our biggest days. The challenges that we really face is uh, tiredness of people. A lot of people uh, did quite a late shift last night. The deadline of Friday in the port is probably a little bit more under pressure now, but uh, we have to be flexible and adapt. The team's biggest challenge is the giant dome, a metal and canvas portable 100-seat cinema. It's a 13-metre-high dome-shaped thing, almost uh, 20 metres diameter at the base. Uh, the cover needs to be lifted off with a crane, so it's always a bit nerve-wracking. Um, but, you know, hopefully uh, with the right equipment, uh, it should all go smoothly. But as soon as the job begins, the crew hits a snag. Yeah, we need to go up and uh, just uh, unstuck it. The crane can't get high enough and the canvas can't be safely removed. Thanks to strong Atlantic winds, the yachts in the ocean race are on their way to Cape Town and scheduled to arrive in a matter of days. The holdup in Alicante has put Piotr Ostrowski and the logistics team around four hours behind schedule. If they can't shift it, one of the critical elements of the race village may not be going anywhere. Immingham, on the northeast coast of England, at the mouth of the Humber estuary. The 22,000-ton bulk carrier, the Pochard S, is in port after negotiating the narrow lock before dawn. As one of the six hatches is released, 26,000 tons of fertilizer worth seven million pounds is exposed to the elements for unloading. Yeah, I mean, it's really good to get the vessel alongside to get us working uh, a good day's weather and get a really good start. So that's really important, you know, to get, just to get the mission underway. So our big challenge now is just the weather. You know, everything now is running great. Uh, if the weather comes in, everything stops, the lids come down, and then we're, we're at the mercy of the weather, really. While the weather holds, the urea fertilizer is taken out one grab at a time into a hopper and released into trucks below, waiting to take it to the storage shed. The bulk carrier must leave in 96 hours, and the dockside crew are under pressure to unload over 6,000 tonnes a day. But the load must be removed evenly to stop the vessel leaning over to one side. We can see we've got hold one, hatch one. OK, the, the crane driver's taking the cargo out in a nice, even uh, direction to make sure we maintain the balance of the vessel. The urea is made in Egypt by combining ammonia and carbon dioxide into granules under high pressure and high temperature. It just looks like sugar, I suppose, and you know, and you can really smell the, the urea um, sent to it. This is the kind of things that people don't anticipate when they see bags of fertiliser on farm. You know, this is how it gets here, and this is what we have to do to get it out. Each grab by the crane's bucket contains 18 tonnes of fertiliser. At 300 quid a tonne, that's over £5,000 worth per pickup, so nothing can be wasted. Once he knows the grab's tight enough, He'll lift it out of the vessel, put it into the hopper and into the transport. The driver's happy now that he's not going to lose any product as it goes from the vessel to the hopper. But we need to stay within our target of losing less than half a percent of this 26,000 tonne cargo. Not many people get to see what we see. You know, products this far back down the supply chain and get to play with essentially what, you know, big boys toys, you know, the 150 tonne cranes, six tonne grabs, you know, 200 metre long vessels. You know, it is, it's really exciting. It's going to take almost 1,500 pickups 
to get all the fertilizer out, carefully watched by the hatchman. Crane driver is up in his cabin there. He can't always see the inside ledge of the vessel. This guy's acting as his eyes and ears to make sure that we don't damage the vessel in any way and that we're making sure the cargo is coming out nice and evenly. Spotter Michael Howard All right, buddy. is making sure they don't miss a granule. So discharge is going well. Are you happy with everything? Yeah, yeah, we're mainly discharging from the offside because there was a little bit of a lift on the ship, but it seems to be going all right now. Right, OK, so we're keeping the vessel stable. Yeah. It looks like it might rain in a little bit, so as soon as it does, we'll close the lids. Okay, it's over. As fast as the crane fills up the hopper, the lorries are loaded up to take it to the warehouse. But with 26,000 tonnes to unload, dry space is at a premium. These guys are coming directly from the vessel, tipping onto the floor. The guys in the two loading shovels are just pushing that cargo up, and they'll continue to do that until the car goes all the way back to where we're stood now. 20 tonne loading shovels, 40 foot blades, pushing the cargo as high as we possibly can. It falls to driver George Peck to build a seven metre high fertiliser mountain. Right, so I'm just backing up, getting ready for a good run up. The idea is to get as much speed as possible. It's push, climb, gathering the gear, getting as high as you possibly can, whilst the other shovel driver is just coming along the side of me, pushing up what I've gathered together. OK, and this is, this is the stuff. This is your granular urea. OK, so this is the stuff that goes on the fields and ultimately you know, affects what we buy in Tesco. So it's really important that we, we treat this cargo with the utmost respect, keep it, you know, keep it pure white, so that when it gets to the farm, it's in the condition it arrived here in. Get back through, get a bit of speed. Boom! Two weeks ago, this stuff was in Egypt. It was manufactured in Egypt, loaded into the vessel, made its transition over to Immingham, and now it's being unloaded uh, into the shed now. You can see the guys behind us working in tandem together, getting the heap as high as they can. Making a good run up. Plenty of speed, more speed the better. Impact. Beautiful. Not very often you get to drive a big old truck that is, Tonka Toy. Smash. Lovely. Okay, so there's over a million pounds worth of cargo off already. The whole shipment's around about seven and a half million quid's worth. So, you know, really starting to see some value in the shed now. But there's still plenty more to unload. The Pushard S needs to set sail again in three days. But the clouds on the horizon could shut the whole operation down. In the Atlantic Ocean, seven crews are racing from southern Spain towards Cape Town in South Africa. When they arrive in a matter of days, it's vital the support team's base camps are in place. Back at the starting line in Alicante, the logistics team have a parallel race to get all the buildings ready for shipping. The support offices and team headquarters are still being broken down and put into 130 containers. A giant 13 metre high geodesic dome, which houses a 100 seat cinema, is proving tricky to dismantle as the only crane on site is too small and the canvas cover is stuck on the frame. It's supposed to not happen. Should not happen. It's just a little price you pay when the crane's too short. Construction coordinator Piotr Ostrowski has to call in a portable lift. But up top, elbow grease is all he has to help unsnag it. Finally, it's free. But almost 30 metres up in the air, the wind is picking up. And just as they attempt to gently lower it down, 700 kilograms of canvas comes crashing down, smothering Piotr and his Australian colleague, Steve Larson. They emerge stunned and unscathed, but the same can't be said for the top of the cover, which is still attached to the crane. When they examine the torn canvas, Steve's clear what happened. The little repair was a bit unrepaired. 
The constant building and dismantling over the years can take its toll on the structures. It was an old repair in the fabric after the last race back in 2014. The tour, I think they're, they're just going to have to buy the bullet and, uh, and replace it. With the canvas sent off for repairs, they need to safely dismantle the frame. The bigger crane has finally arrived on site and holds it in midair while Piotr and his crew break it down layer by layer. But the team are now six hours behind schedule and night is beginning to fall before the frame is finally loaded up. You have good days and you have bad days and the level of progress has been slightly frustrating today. The ship that's picking up the containers is heading towards Spain and arrives in 48 hours. Quite nerve-wracking at the moment. Um, we know that there's a, a long way to go and we don't really have much more time. Work will have to continue well into the night. Things are happening, but it's just whether they're happening fast enough. And right now, the programme is slipping across the board. Just outside Grimsby, on England's northeast coast, lies the port of Immingham. A team of 20 dock workers have just four days to unload 26,000 tonnes of nitrogen fertiliser that arrived from Egypt. Charge hand Tom Close must keep the cargo moving, but with only a quarter of it unloaded, one of the pneumatic fenders protecting the hull from the concrete wall has been forced out of the water by the weight of the bulk carrier. We've asked the vessel to slacken its mooring ropes off, and then uh, we'll be able to just nudge it back in the dock. With the vessel moving around, the unload is temporarily suspended for safety reasons. Now, currently, I've had to stop just because the ship's going to be pulled away from the quayside. Obviously, you don't want the grabs really swinging in, could cause damage or something. And obviously, it's not really safe for people working alongside the ship. We're pulling away, and we keep working. It's also a challenge for key foreman Alan Cook. Everything's at a stop now. We've got guys waiting in the sheds. While the bulk carrier's moved away from the dock, ready to be remoored. Hopefully, when he tightens the ropes on the aft end of the ship, it might just pull the front end off a little bit and the fender should roll back into the dock. Should. <laughs> By loosening the ropes holding the ship to the dock side, Alan's hoping gravity's going to help them out. Get in. There you go. Woohoo! Yeah, it's back in. Yeah, I think we're good to go, mate. Both cranes back up and running. No stoppages for the past couple of hours. Hopefully, it just keeps going on like this throughout the rest of the shift. We'll get another two and a half thousand ton off, and uh, we'll be on the way to the good tonnage really for the day. But while they've been fixated on the rogue fender, ominous clouds have been gathering. Yeah, there's some quite dark clouds coming across now. Um, hopefully it isn't rain showers. Like I said earlier, when I checked the weather forecast, it, it said it would stop about 10 o'clock or no more. But you know the British weather's like, it always changes, so it, there might be more to come yet. Tom Close and the team have to work fast, but that doesn't mean cutting corners, as farmers expect their fertiliser to arrive in perfect condition. Cargo surveyor Francois Cutterso is on quality control. Obviously, the quality is paramount. If it's too small and too fine, too dusty, when it comes to final use on the fields, it will just blow in the wind without being spread properly. And, and the same with during the bagging process. If it's too small, uh, a lot of it will be put as waste because it cannot be going through the system. Francois needs to check the fertiliser hasn't been damaged during the sea journey from Egypt. Picking up the product from the fall of the hopper. This allows us as well to control temperature over 30 degrees, so it's, it's pretty good. When you pay £7 million for your fertiliser, you need to know you've got what you've ordered. These products are extremely weather sensitive. Um, you don't shut the, hot, the hatches fast enough um, and you carry on discharging and then the product will get affected. They start to dry off, they will go set like concrete. It will become very, very brittle. It crumbles away to dust. I mean, you can see the uh, granules are very well formed. They are bold. It's nice and white, which is very good. 
The farmers want big, loose granules that drop on the fields and gradually dissolve over time. Everything is contained on the higher size scales, which means that the product is stable and is very good. Any type of contamination will have huge financial implication. New hopper operator Connor Gardner must ensure he maintains quality while racing against the darkening skies. The job of the hopper is to basically filter the product through into the wagons in a safe way. It goes in cycles. One minute there's six or seven wagons there and it's flying and then next minute you're down for ten minutes or five minutes. After more than ten years as a truck driver, Richard Robinson has developed a communication shorthand with the hopper operators. We know the truck's full when he's beeping his hole. As soon as he's hit his target weight, he'll beep, and that's when we shut everything off and he'll pull away. Once on board, it falls to Richard and the team to get each load into the warehouse half a mile away. About 29 tonne in the body. That'll put us at about 44 tonne overall. We're weighing the load. Is it your last load? No. Wish it were, though. <laughs> With just under 20,000 tonnes still needing to be unloaded in the warehouse, Connor's day is about to get a lot tougher. The heavens are ready to open. Yeah, I think we'll get that for sure. Get yourself under some cover, mate. The top of the hopper is immediately covered by the crane's bucket. The fertiliser can withstand some moisture, but if it gets too wet, it'll combine into one big useless pile. But the jaws at the bottom of the hopper have suffered a malfunction. They're stuck shut, and the exposed fertiliser can't be released to the safety of the dry lorry below. Aye, 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 I'll show the fitters. I'm gonna get the fitters to come out and check. Did they press the uh, helping reset button on the hopper? I have, mate, yeah. The rain is a major problem. On the vessel, the covers are pulled across the hold to protect the fertiliser granules. But Francois worried the load stuck in the hopper will get saturated. Is it completely down? Completely down, mate. Because I'm just shutting it down, starting to a... pelt, completely fell down. We've got a, about a wagon and a half in there as well. Ah, man. So, yeah. There's nothing we can do. Just got a standby guy and he's on his way. No worries. There's nothing we can do. Just what we need. It's not good, really, is it? Couldn't have chose a better time to break down, could it? <laughs> As a torrential downpour flies over us. <laughs> Luckily, the repair crew are there within minutes and managed to solve the problem. I don't know what he's done different to what I did. We'll go in again. That's the bonus. The hopper's emptied into the dry lorry. Help me! OK! Not ideal, but hey By the end of the day, Tom and his team have overcome all the skies could throw at them. And as the rain subsides, the crew can get back to work to unload the remaining 12,000 tonnes. Back in the warehouse, boss Craig is satisfied. So I guess many people don't really think about this kind of thing when they're buying food in supermarkets, how the shipping industry affects the food chain. We discharge fertiliser from vessels into sheds and onto farms, and I suppose in many ways, you know, the shipping industry is the unsung hero of the food chain. Over the winter, much of the fertiliser remains in Immingham until it's delivered to farmers ready to spread over the fields in spring. The county of Essex is renowned for its love of flash motors. But on an industrial estate in the town of Grays, a different class of classic car is cared for by vintage car dealer Richard Bidolf. We don't sell cars, we sell pieces of art. And what you see here is a piece of art for somebody. The prized possession in Richard's collection, a 1931 eight-litre Bentley Tourer, valued at over one million pounds. Bentleys have long been the pinnacle of British engineering but their hefty price tag means they're reserved for a very particular clientele. Any self-respecting millionaire is going to want to have one of these. <laughs> it's just a beautiful thing to drive. I mean, it's the sort of car that when you drive it down the road, mothers lock their daughters up and they see you coming. <laughs> it's full on Mr Toad. It may look like it should be in Wind in the Willows, but this automotive work of art comes with a colourful history. 
It's an 8 litre Bentley, um, built in 1930, just before Bentley went bankrupt. Shipped new to Singapore, the Maoist Chinese owner used it as a form of transportation to take his girlfriend to the races, to be blunt. It was known as the Horam Saloon. The car can clearly tell a few stories and has a price tag of £1.2 million. But to sell it, it needs to be put on display at Birmingham's Classic Car Show, 140 miles away. Final polish before we get ready to load. Get a couple of marks out of here. We lighten the show up all ready to go. It's too risky to drive such a valuable car on the open road. And when it comes to shipping luxury motors, specialist haulage firm Straight 8 Logistics have just the men for the job. Spencer Wynne Greensmith and Simon Davis have been charged with the safe delivery of the million pound Bentley and four other precious classics. A 1923 Alvis 1240 Ducks Back Tourer, a 1927 Bugatti Type 35B, a 1932 MG Magna F Type Salonette, and a 1954 Bentley R Type Sport Special. They need to get to the Birmingham NEC in time for the annual classic car show. It's quite a big drama, lots of logistics. Um, it's always a bit of a headache getting everything sorted in time. We're going to drive these cars down, get them on the truck, get them unloaded and get them on the stand. So um, it's a lot for us to do. Hopefully we won't be bringing them all back at the end of the show. We'll see. Get a few sold. Jing, jing. The truck that will carry them to Birmingham must be precisely loaded. Spencer and Simon have turned carrying classic cars into an art form in itself. Basically, two decks, flat top deck, which we can extend. We can lower the middle section of the bottom deck for higher vehicles. Walk around it, make sure everything's where it needs to be, ready for cars to come on. Inside the warehouse, Richard Bidolf and partner Christoph Cowens are ready to load two million pounds worth of cars. What I think is you give directions. Yep, absolutely. Left a bit, right a bit. Chris and I'll do the driving. Yep. That way, any damage is done to us. So the first one upstairs will be the Bentley. 1.2 million pounds. Cross fingers, it all goes well. Great piece of kit, lovely thing to drive. But it is a big old truck. Question is, will it start? Starting. Retard, a bit of throttle, neutral, ignition. Only 100 Bentley Tourers were made, but as Richard got the skills to reverse a 96-year-old worth over a million pounds down a steep slope. Let's see if we're going forwards or backwards. Backwards, that's a good oh, start. Yeah, that's fine. Follow it up. Piece of cake. Stage one complete, now just a question of squeezing her on board. The problem is, the car is 1.8 metres wide and the truck has only 25 centimetres of extra space either side. Straight up. Yeah, we're ready to go. As you crest the top, it does dip away from you. No so, worries. all right? Just don't want to slip the clutch. No, no, but if you feel that's going to happen, yeah. just get onto the deck and we can lift it up. we just got to take it easy. We've got to make sure we go up in one smooth run no clutch slip and just stop on a dime, basically. The safety of the million pound motor rests on Richard's skills behind the wheel. One slip of the clutch could make for a very costly repair. He's made it, but to stop it rolling out, the transporters must strap her in with a wheel chop bar. Okay, handbrake on, in gear. Handbrake on, in gear. Can you just stay in the vehicle for me for one minute while I just get at least one strap round it? Joel, we always get one strap on the wheel before we get out of the car just to make sure it's secure and uh, very straightforward. Absolutely as planned. The MG presents a different challenge. It's a much thinner car and the running tracks in the lorry are a fixed width apart. Wow, that is narrow. There is a risk or damage to tyre. We could fall Just, off between the two if we're not careful. Yeah, if we're not careful, yeah. Guiding the MG on board, Richard's assistant, Christoph Cowens. Straight up. Who has no choice but to run the tyres right on the edge.
but the MG manages to stay on track. Next, it's the R-Type Bentley Special. A new ride for Richard. Break my Bentley Special virginity. Never driven this car before. Press the button and see what happens. Not much is the answer. There we go. Sounds nice. With one and a half million pounds worth of cars already squeezed onto just 13 metres of track, it's a tight and very expensive fit. We do bring the cars closer than what some people would think you would bring them. We generally rule a fist distance between the two. The cars don't move when they're strapped, and even if they do move, because of the nature of the trailer, they all move together. Therefore, they're all moving in the same direction. They don't do their individual things. What we're trying to avoid is obviously this one becoming loose in any way, shape or form and damaging the back of this one. Not only have you damaged the back of this one, you've also damaged the front of this one. So doubling your bill. The 90-year-old Bugatti Type 35 should be small enough to fit on the truck, but Christoph's got his own size issues. The problem is it's not very easy to handle because it's an old racing car, essentially. Tiny wheels and pedals. And so I forgot that I have to take off my shoes every time I get in it. It's got an incredible amount of power and no brakes. So, I mean, what could possibly go wrong? With the first three cars loaded, on the top deck, a new challenge has been presented. The lower deck is only one and a half metres high, and Christoph needs to duck. Despite the risks, packing the cars in tight can also present a business opportunity. We've got so much room in this big truck, I'm almost wondering if we shouldn't take a sixth car, maybe a Silver Ghost or something, just so we've got a bonus car up there in case we sell something. 15, 16, 17 we can do. But will there be enough room to cram in an extra Rolls-Royce worth £178,000? So we're going to drive her in all the way onto the lower deck in the middle. Uh, we'll secure her and then we'll lower the deck to the floor. Pump some fuel pressure up. Ignition on. Mixture full rich. Retard. Bit of hand throttle. Let's see if she goes. She's away. The windscreen's folded down. But as a last minute addition, no one's sure if they can squeeze her in. In Alicante, Spain, the Volvo Round the World Yacht Race support crew are under pressure. It's day four of an operation to pack up a whole village of team offices, pavilions and tents that need to get to Cape Town. Seven teams heading towards South Africa expect their base camps to be there when they arrive in a matter of days. Each team base is like a pit lane for the yacht, where management, sailors and engineers work out strategy and carry out repairs. Over 2,000 separate parts involving over 300 tons of steel and over 100 panels. The only way operations manager Jeremy Troughton can ship them is by flat pack. They're essentially made up of eight sections which, which move on a flat rack and then one 40-foot container, and inside that 40-foot container is the, the posts and the doors and the, the materials to build it with. Jeremy's put Ferry van der Waal in charge of the crew packing up the last few team bases. It's a big circus which needs to be moved and packed up. The huge structure is carefully stacked on the flat pack trailers. Well, the challenge is to be ready on time, that's for sure. But uh, the rest comes natural to me. This is what I love doing. And the dirtier my hands are, the better I feel. Awesome, love it. I, mean, I grew up in the circus, I'm going from city to city. Nobody will ever get it out of my system, that's for sure. There's only one difference in a real circus and here. In a real circus, you have two clowns. In this circus, well, we got hundreds. But safety is no laughing matter. 
it's easy to lose a finger between metal and metal. Sometimes the guys, they look there, but they're holding it here, and then it's too late. Each base camp is made up of metal framed units that must be dismantled room by room. All designed to fit perfectly. This is the limit we have, and we are absolutely not allowed to go even a centimeter higher. And we are about five centimeters under, which is great. Once the flat packs are loaded, they'll be stacked on board the 300 meter long Maersk Luce, which is scheduled to dock at Algeciras port, 380 miles away, before it sets off again for Cape Town. And the boat is always going uh, left to right, up and down, and then you get all the dents in the container which we don't want. So we strap it all nice down, and it will always stay uh, good. They're running out of time, and once full, each container needs to be loaded onto a truck and get on the road to the port, seven hours drive away. We are still behind, and it doesn't take much to sort of push us further behind. At 12 meters long, they're the biggest containers in global shipping, and fully loaded can weigh up to 22 tons. Crew member Ruben Don right. is working in a limited space. We have a pretty fully loaded container with a, quite a heavy one, so um, indeed not so much maneuverability. And we need to first, so we're going to lift it, then we need to turn it 180 degrees, and only then we can uh, actually land it on the truck. We have to be careful with the lamppost as well, so um, there's a lot of things um, which are not in a perfect position. With the giant 12 meter long box swinging in the air, palm trees and lampposts quickly become a very real problem. This is really, uh, I think, pretty much as close as it can get. <laughs> it falls to Ruben's gentle but steady hand to push over 20 tons of container clear of the street lighting. The more you get the weight forward away from the boom, the diff more difficult it gets. You're on the limit of what we can do. And that limit has just been reached. I don't know what's going on. The, the container is stuck on, <laughs> on the crane. Hey, boom like it. It's not possible, hey, boom like this. The crew have to lever the container away from the crane, allowing the truck to safely reverse underneath. <laughs> yeah, very happy about it. Safe and sound, up to the next one. It's taken four days to load up nearly 2,000 tons of flat pack buildings okay. into 130 containers. Everyone has said it wouldn't be possible in the time we've had, but what we try to do is achieve the unachievable and battle against what other people think is impossible. Transported by a 100 lorry convoy on their seven hour journey to the port of Algeciras. The yachts out at sea are facing their own challenges but they're blissfully unaware of the problems their ground teams have had on land. We've had the race within the race, but all working as one team to get the job done. With just minutes to spare, the final containers arrive on site. It takes the containers 12 days to make the 8,500 mile trip to Cape Town, South Africa. So here we are in Cape Town. We've got the majestic Table Mountain behind us and uh, we just started delivering the first containers onto site here in Cape Town. We're ready to start all over again. For the first time, they've managed to build and dismantle this year's facilities for the sailors and fans of round the world yacht racing. With 10 more countries to visit over the next 10 months, this is just the beginning. The yachtsmen and women get much of the glory, but behind the scenes, the logistics operation keeps the race on the move. In Essex, Richard Biddle's trying to squeeze a 178,000 pound Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost into the back end of a car transporter. Hold it there a second. She's, uh, yeah, we've just we've got an inch spare here. Luckily, there's just enough room. A bonus. We always like bonuses. Oh, I'm really happy about this. This is great news. I mean, it's a tight squeeze. There was an inch. A quarter of an inch, we'd have been worried, but hey, she made it in. That's fine. And it gives us another chance to sell something. So, um, really happy to have this. It's a great car. And last up, the 1923 Alvis, which nearly comes a cropper. Shut the door. 
before she's safely tucked in the final slot. Yep, we're all loaded. Uh, we've got the extra car on that, the, uh, that Richard requested. He's all very happy about that. So we're just closing up and we'll be setting off shortly to the NEC. There's 140 miles of traffic to negotiate and they need to make it before nightfall, so time is pressing. With nearly two million pounds worth of unique motoring history in the back, it's one of the most valuable loads Spencer's transported. So you've got to think what you've got in the back. It is not so easily replaceable and it's an awful lot of money. But we want to get there safely and we want to get there quickly. Without the worry of two million pounds of cars to tow, Richard Bidolf has beaten Spencer to the motor show. We're waiting for the truck, we're here, it's getting dark. We're hoping the cars are all in good shape. Um, excited, let's get them off and get them unloaded. Where is it? Come on. Should be here any moment. I'm antsy. Here he is. It's a pretty sight, eh? Yo! Yeah, we made it here in one piece, so there we go. Any movement en route could have cost the transporters thousands of pounds. The bonus Silver Ghost arrives unscathed. OK, straight in the hall. At this stage, we've come so far, yet we don't want to make it fall on the last turn. Having been successfully loaded... Hold it there a sec, I've got to check the back. ..getting the unload angles right is crucial. If it's too steep, the back end could scrape on the tarmac. OK. Nice and gently. £1.2 million pounds worth of car can't be taken lightly. She's clear? Yeah, she's clear. Let's see if we can get a bit of a roll on. There's been no damage. Uh, Rich has checked all the cars. Our £2 million pound load has arrived safely and handed back over to its owner. And behind every mega shipment is mega money. If we sell one of these, the show is paid for. If we sell one of these, a couple of months is paid for. If we sell two or three, we're going to have a very good Christmas. And Richard did have a good festive season. Three cars sold, including the Silver Ghost, for £170,000, ending up in Italy. <laughs>